We as arena players always want everything to be as quick and easy as possible. Every second spent doing stuff that's not arena sucks. Like leveling for instance, the quicker 60 to 70 takes the better. Even gearing, this should also be as quick as possible. Honor and conquest gear should come in abundance. There should be zero grinds at all. We as a community just want to jump into arena. But one of the biggest and massively overlooked pitfalls of this barrier of entry being so streamlined is the fact that if something becomes overpowered, it's going to completely dominate the arena meta. Which is exactly what we're seeing for Retribution Paladins, Demonology Warlocks, Mistweaver Monks, and Restoration Shamans right now. The upside of this is that you're always going to have a pretty good idea of what you're going to be coming up against, meaning you can prepare. So we thought, why not reach out to some of the best players in each of these meta-dominant specs and ask them exactly how you best play against them. Welcome to Counter the Meta. Starting off, we have the most popular and highest performing melee in existence right now, who after their recent rework became absolute gods. Gods do bleed though, and the first thing you need to be on the lookout for is still obviously their main cooldown of Avenging Wrath. This now, however, is a one minute cooldown rather than two, despite coming twice as often. Retribution is still not a huge threat outside of wings, meaning you always want to be playing around this and expecting high bursts during its uptime. Be sure to track Avenging Wrath with Omnibar, and be prepared for high incoming damage by trading defensive cooldowns as effectively as you can. We've all seen the Rhett wheelchair memes, and it's common knowledge amongst players that they have poor mobility, and thus kiting a Rhett is the best way to counter them. Since the rework, this is actually false. Kiting is one of the least effective ways of dealing with the Retribution Paladin now. The reason for this is that most of the key abilities in Judgment, Final Verdict, and Blade of Justice are now all a minimum of 20 yard range, as well as the rest of the key abilities being 8 yard range now thanks to the talent Crusader's Reprieve. So now you're going to just be dying from across the map if you look to kite. This means the best way to combat a Retribution Paladin with wings active is to instead look to hard CC them. Another misconception is that disarm effects are a waste on Rhett. This is also now false, as Final Verdict no longer goes through disarm like it previously did. Meaning, if you're a spec that has access to disarm, it's a great way to limit some of the damage coming from Avenging Wrath. Countering Rhett isn't just about crowd controlling them or trading cooldowns during Avenging Wrath. You're also going to want to try and play around their Fist of Justice. This is a relatively short cooldown due to being reduced by any holy power spent. What you can exploit though is that this is not only a 10 yard range, but also a magic stun. Meaning, as healer, you will want to try and play as far away from the Rhett as possible in order to force them to have to wait for cross crowd control if they want to hodge the kill target or make it very telegraphed if they want to hodge you. Blessings are another way you can look to play around Rhett. Blessing of protection can be removed by any offensive dispel. And with the rework of Unbound Freedom now, so can Blessing of Freedom, so be on the lookout for these and remove them if you can. You will also not want to ever let a Rhett use Blessing of Sanctuary for free. This will remove all fear, silence, and stun effects from the target, and if not played around, will be a surefire way of ruining your setup. Cross crowd controlling a Rhett before using one of these forms of crowd control onto their healer is a great way to deny its use, or otherwise force a trinket out of them, which you can later exploit. In 10.0.7, Rhett's also got an additional defensive cooldown in the form of Divine Protection, but with the large amount of rerolls and inexperienced Rhett's around, almost every single one of them combines this alongside Shield of Vengeance. This means they're tankier while it's active, but it also means that they are just as vulnerable as they were prior to the patch during the 50 second window it's down. You'll also want to always keep an eye out for Forbearance. This is applied by Blessing of Protection, Spell Warding, and Lay on Hands. Rhett's in some cases will use these as a way to hold onto their Divine Shield, but whenever any of them are used will give you a 30 second window you can exploit to score a kill if you have the means to do so. Game knowledge is without a doubt one of the most important aspects you need if you're serious about climbing rating in WoW Arena. But unless you've been playing WoW for years at a high level, something just as simple as knowing what abilities or cooldowns to pay attention to can be a difficult task in itself. Come on, there are 13 unique classes with the flavor of the month changing all the time. This is why over at skillcap.com, we've worked with some of the best players in the world in order to develop a brand new course that teaches you everything you need to know in order to play with or against every class in the meta right now, including how they look to set up kills, how they aim to survive, what you need to track and be aware of, their strengths and their weaknesses, on top of so much more. And our guides are proven to produce results, which is how we were able to offer a guarantee that you will gain at least 400 rating while actively using our website. So if you want to access the best resources for learning WoW PvP, be sure to check out skillcap.com after this video. Links in the description below. Restoration Shamans have climbed the healing totem pole and are now one of the most dominant healers, but they're surprisingly easy to counter if you know what to look out for. 
The most exploitable part of Restoration Shaman is that so much of their inherent power is tied into totems, totems that you can very easily kill. Healing Tide is the big one, and as a rule, if you see this dropped, then you should immediately try and kill it. This is so crucial that many top players even have a weak aura to easily identify the moment it's dropped. Healing Tide is one of a Shaman's best recovery tools, and with every consecutive tick, will ramp up its healing by 25%. Not to mention, if the Shaman is playing Tide Turner, it will also increase any further healing that the target receives. Equally as important to kill since 10.0.7 is now Healing Stream Totem. This previously wasn't really worth the effort to kill, but with the reworked Swirling Currents Healing Stream healing has gone through the roof and makes up for a large majority of a Shaman's overall healing output. If you have the means to do so, killing these will drastically reduce the Shaman's overall and more importantly instant healing output, forcing them to have to cast. It's not only healing totems that you should be aiming to kill, but there is also Grounding, Stone Skin, Sky Fury, and even Spirit Link, all of which should ideally be killed on sight. Take Grounding Totem for example. This will redirect any spells cast during its uptime to the totem for 3 seconds. While this may not seem like a lot, and for most melee it doesn't even concern you, this feels like a lifetime for casters, and can potentially prevent massive amounts of damage or important crowd control. So whether you're a caster, melee, or even healer, if you see a grounding totem, target it and kill it. It dies in one hit to any ability. One thing to take note of when it comes to killing some of the higher priority totems is that every 10 seconds, the shaman is able to move them with totemic projection. So being quick, killing them from range, or even in the case of healing tied totem in specific, moving to where the shaman has repositioned the totem is going to still be worth doing. Staying on the topic of totems, the next one you need to be aware of is Earthen Wall. This is for some reason is often undervalued or not even considered as a defensive when in fact it's a Restoration Shaman's best answer for mitigating any damage, especially when combined with the talent Totemic Recall for the Double Earthen. Much like with any defensive cooldown, you obviously want to avoid popping your offensives into this if it's already down. On top of that, due to the positional requirement, it's good practice to try and force your opponent to move out whenever possible. Moving away from Totem Stomping, another great way to counter Shamans, assuming you're a class that can, is to use offensive dispels on your kill target. When you think healers that struggle into offensive dispels, Shamans are usually not the first that come to mind, but the combination of Riptide and especially Earth Shield make up a large portion of Shamans' overall healing output. Removing these at times of pressure, or whenever the Shaman is caught in crowd control, will massively limit their sustained healing output. Lastly, when facing a Restoration Shaman as a melee, don't be afraid to pressure them. It's a common misconception that Shamans make bad targets, but this couldn't be more false. Surprisingly, in the current meta, they make one of the best targets for melee to swap to, and even in some cases, train, as they passively take a lot more damage when compared to most other healers. It also makes killing totems a lot easier, and if you stick onto a Shaman for long enough, they're going to inevitably run out of instant healing and be forced to cast. This is going to be even more beneficial if you have any spread pressure going out. Ah, Fist Weavers. I don't think anybody, regardless of what spec you play, enjoys facing a Fist Weaver monk. There is a certain unrivaled level of frustration and annoyance when the enemy healer is just standing on top of you, roundhouse kicking you in the head every few seconds. But their main strength just so happens to be their biggest weakness, positioning. Fist Weavers are strong right now because of the just sheer amount of healing output they're capable of. Nothing is comparable. The problem this causes is that it's almost impossible to score a kill or even just create pressure with high sustained damage alone. And especially in solo shuffle, the meta for the most part is just to do as much damage as possible. The number one counter to this is to surprisingly play arena like it's supposed to be played, aiming to combine your crowd control with damage. This, while usually coming with some difficulties, is made increasingly easy due to a Fist Weaver's positioning, as they're always going to be in the middle of the map. So hold your burst damage, wait for crowd control, and align the two, you'll see a vast difference in the pressure you can create. If you're lacking crowd control, a very good tip is to even look to just kite the Mist Weaver. If they're unable to hit a target, they don't heal. And without Invoke GG, are susceptible to roots and slows just like any other melee would be. Otherwise, even going on and focusing the Fist Weaver is a viable tactic. To do so, it requires you to play around Transcendence and Restoral. Both of these can be used inside of stuns, and in fact, a lot of the time Fist Weavers neglect to even pick up Eminence, making their only answer to stuns being Restoral. This makes them a prime kill target if you have the ability to lock them down and burst. And just even in general, if you're able to force Restoral and Life Cocoon Monks really lack any way to recover, so take advantage of that. Even if you're not looking to focus the Mist Weaver, keeping track of these cooldowns is still crucial, as you need to be aware and remember that the monk can potentially look to immune or port away from crowd control. Granted, it's not every game that you can coordinate swaps or CC chains, and luckily, there are a few other ways to counter Fist Weavers, one of them being to continuously move out of the blue you see on the floor. This is called Feline Stomp, 
and whenever the monk is allowed to stand inside, we'll be doing massively bolstered healing due to the Talon's ancient concordance and awakened feline that enhance blackout kick and tiger palm. Not only that, but while inside, the monk will also continuously be resetting the cooldown of Feyland Stump entirely. This is important because it's one of their main ways to gain ancient teachings, the buff that makes fist weaving possible to begin with. So, moving out of the stomp will not only drastically decrease their healing output, but also force them to have to quickly channel Essence Font in order to fist weave. Finally, if you're a class with access to an offensive purge, a great tip is to always remove Enveloping Mist whenever you see it, as doing so will drastically reduce their healing output, as it not only does good healing on its own right, but also buffs further healing by 30%. This can be applied either by channeling Soothing Mist, which is rare for fist weavers, or more commonly via Thunder Focus T or Invoke Chi Chi. Last up, we've got Demonology Warlocks. Before we even start the first action, we advise is to turn off minor nameplates. You can't even begin to try and counter a Demo Warlock if you can't see your screen. Now that that's done, the next step to playing into Demo Warlocks is playing around Demonic Tyrant. If you've ever wondered why you or your team are suddenly taking so much damage, then this is why. Tyrant is essentially what the entire spec revolves around, and with 10.0.7 and the addition of Reign of Tyranny, it only got stronger, as now they're not so reliant on ramping up the damage. There are multiple ways to play around Tyrant. You could always try and interrupt the initial cast. This is of course always good to do, as Warlocks will still aim to try and align the summon with additional pets to make the most out of the ability, but you obviously can't prevent it forever, and when the Tyrant inevitably comes out, you need to take action, as sitting there and just tanking the damage is never going to be a good choice. Due to its pet AI, one of the most effective strategies is to just line of sight the tyrant with a pillar. But if this can't be done, then you can also look to either interrupt the tyrant itself, kill the tyrant, or even look to crowd control it. Another equally important ability you will want to make sure you're tracking and playing around is Fell Obelisk, and is often used in conjunction with tyrant. Fell Obelisk is basically a totem that will provide not only the Demo Warlock themselves, but all of their minions with 20% attack and cast speed. We suggest grabbing yourself a weak aura to more easily track Fell Obelisk, and then taking the time to kill it whenever the Warlock drops it. Knowing what spells to kick against Demonology Warlocks is also important, and aside from Tyrant, the other spells you'll more than likely see are Shadow Bolt, Summon Vile Fiend, Fear, and Hand of Gul'dan. The ability you should aim to interrupt is always Hand of Golden. As much like a Destruction Warlock's Chaos Bolt, this will actually lock them out on all schools of magic and prevent them from gaining additional Demon Bolt procs. Fear is of course situational. You'll obviously still want to prevent fears in your teammates at opportune times, but bear in mind that they can still cast Hand of Golden straight after. Then Shadow Bolt is the lowest priority, and in most cases it will just be the Warlock's attempt to try and bait your interrupt. Hands down, the best way to counter a Demonology Warlock, if the opportunity arises, is to kill their Fell Guard. Without a pet, Demonology is useless. They rely on it for not only damage, healing reduction, resource generation, survivability, you name it. Simultaneously pressure the pet if you can. Just by dotting it up or just passively cleaving it can in a lot of cases drop the pet low, especially if you're focusing the Warlock and factor in the Soul Link damage on top. If the pet dies, the only way for the Warlock to get it back is with Fell Domination, and if you're able to kill the second pet within a 3 minute window, or better yet, just prevent the cast by purging Fell Domination, or even kicking the fast cast so your teammate can. In doing so, you'll turn the Warlock into a target dummy that will have to spend the rest of the game trying to resummon his pet. The final way to counter Demonology Warlock is to use the way they function to your advantage. What we mean by this is that Demo will inherently summon a small army of pets during your games, and a large majority of specs can actually use this to their benefit. For example, Shadow Priests are able to Shadow Crash a clump of imps and generate a permanent stream of instant cast damage procs. Demon Hunters are able to cleave the pets and gain 20% increased damage from the Soul Fragments. Fist Weavers can use the pets to just rotate Blackout Kick and Tiger Palm for infinite healing, as well as, just like Windwalkers, use them as a way to keep up permanent Alpha Tiger. And there are plenty more examples. There you have it, those are some of the best tips for countering the meta right now. And if you're interested in learning the best ways to navigate Solo Shuffle for your class, one of the best ways is through our arena commentaries over at skillcap.com. It's there you'll be able to find breakdowns from pro players who take you through their games and guide you step by step through even the toughest matchups. When you combine this alongside our fundamentals courses and damage and healing class courses, you have all the information you need to start climbing the ladder in no time at all. Sound too good to be true? Well, this even comes equipped with a rating gain guarantee, meaning if you don't gain at least 400 rating while actively using our guides, we refund you. Simple as that. So if you want to take the next steps on your solo shuffle journey, visit skillcap.com to get started. As always, thank you all for watching, good luck in your climb, and from everyone here at Skillcapped, we hope you have a great rest of your day.